Ministers are expected to give the go-ahead to vaccine booster shots, COVID passports for clubs and stadia, and the biggest flu jab rollout in history to ease pressure on the NHS. But with the government seeking to extend the Coronavirus Act for another six months, is another lockdown on the cards? Given the economic, human and societal damage, should we rule out future lockdowns and learn to live with the virus? To debate this, I'm delighted to welcome two heavyweights. Dr. Brat Pankania, senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School, and Professor David Payton, professor of industrial economics at Nottingham University Business School. I'll start with you, if I may, Professor Payton. Do you think there's a chance of a winter lockdown? Well, if, if the government decide to have one, of course, but I think absolutely they should say now that there will be no lockdown. I think the time for lockdowns is long past and we certainly don't need these other measures they talk about, such as vaccine passports, um, to achieve that. Uh, one of the things that gets me about the lockdown debate is that we, that we speak very little about the costs of lockdowns and as we know they are absolutely huge. Uh, we have not just the economic cost, but the individual personal costs to people most of all, our children. So what one horrifying statistic which, uh, which we saw was that there was a 46% increase in the number of children with eating disorders during lockdowns. So I think it's unthinkable that we should go down that route again. But of course, the real reason is that we now have lots more evidence about whether lockdowns actually have many benefits. And the evidence is now fairly clear that they don't. People assume that lockdowns will have at least saved lives. But you look at the most recent evidence, uh, when you look at sort of all-cause mortality, there's a paper came out just last week that said, um, our conclusion is that lockdowns on balance actually increased mortality. And there's lots of reasons why actually lockdowns are less effective than we think. But because of the downside in terms of people delaying treatment because they're frightened of, uh, uh, of, going, uh, of going to seek treatment, we, and um, depression, which leads to suicide, alcohol addiction, and so on, we end up with more deaths, it seems, than less. So yes, the government should absolutely say, okay, we panicked perhaps at the start, we thought they might be successful, but they haven't been. We've got the data, we should rule them out, give businesses and people confidence we're not going down that route again, and uh, learn to live with the virus, of course, to try and mitigate it as best we can, but we have to learn going forward to live with the virus. And of course, now the most vulnerable are vaccinated. We're not seeing the huge numbers of um, deaths that we saw back in January. Indeed, even though um, nightclubs and everything opened up on the 19th of July, we were promised you know, 100,000 cases per day. People said inevitably they're going to go up. That cases have gone down, particularly under, under the key group 20 to 24 year olds who are you know, most prominent at nightclubs. Cases are now 40% lower than when we opened up on the 19th of July. They've actually gone up amongst 90 plus year olds, but I don't think we can put that down to, uh, to nightclubs. Uh, Dr. Pankania, lockdowns, a failed experiment, never to be repeated. This is a question of horses for courses. Um, we, when we are in outbreak management, we have to use all the armaments at our disposal. Going forward, of course, I agree with my colleague from Nottingham that it is highly unlikely that we are going to go down the route of further shutdowns. Having said that, I really must emphasize that we do not introduce lockdowns lightly. The lockdowns did have a positive effect. They did save lives. And unfortunately, I, I wish I had brought the paper with me. Only last week, uh, my colleagues at Imperial produced a paper that a multi-layered multi approach to restriction of human movements, to other infection control measures, all those things put together do save lives. Your, so what colleagues, would I do your, your I... colleagues at Imperial College who predicted half a million deaths at the start of the pandemic, Brat Pankania, which became the driving force behind these lockdowns. And those doomsday sage models never came to uh, fruition. Can I remind you gently, there are many colleagues at, at Imperial. They're not all in the same basket. If I may continue, please. Um, if there was a novel virus that appeared out of the blue and it was causing infections and we had very little armamentums left and we didn't know what was going on, then in the first instance, 
a measure such as restriction of human movements, human interactions, i.e. Uh, stay at home, would again be appropriate. You cannot go into outbreak management saying to yourselves, you will never have a lockdown because then you are saying that no matter what appears on your doorstep, you will deal with it without having a lockdown. You do not take lockdowns lightly. Absolutely. Schools shutting, places shutting, people staying at home, people with their angina, etc., not calling doctors, all mistakes. Having said that, you just cannot rule it out absolutely. Going forward, the position we are in today, I doubt very much if we will need another lockdown. Um, you say that lockdowns saved lives. There is one peer-reviewed study published in the Spectator magazine that suggests that cases were falling before each of the three national lockdowns, Bharat Pankania. There is also the potential death toll from lockdowns. The uh, University of Bristol published a paper in which they suggested that creating the biggest recession in 300 years, a direct consequence of lockdowns, will claim half a million lives. Unfortunately, the messaging with the lockdown was completely and utterly incorrect. So whilst the lockdown was necessary and required when we had no vaccines and no knowledge of how to curb the rising number of cases, which incidentally, had we acted earlier, faster, sooner, we wouldn't have had the exponential rise in cases. This is all at the current government's doorstep. They acted late, they acted slowly, and that is why we had to have those shutdowns and lockdowns. Now then, and then, and then they got the messaging wrong, and the messaging was stay at home, save lives. So unfortunately, people died, and they died not because of COVID, but because they took that instruction literally, which was don't bother us, the hospital is full with COVID. If you got your angina, so be it, don't bother us. That was the message people took. But right, they, they colleagues... couldn't get an appointment. They were sent home. They were told to go to A&E. I hear you and I'm with you. And I say that is such a failing. And that is the failing of the National Health Service capacity. It is a failing. But if we are discussing lockdowns or are we discussing how did we get our messages out with respect to your illnesses, your your strokes, your heart attacks, your anginas, etc. We didn't act well, right, we didn't get our messages right. I don't know if it's messaging. I mean, I think that, that we had a national lockdown, but I think the NHS went into lockdown as well and became the national COVID service. People were told not to bother their GPs. GP surgeries were actually chained shut, you know, and it was an absolute disgrace. Ultimately, the NHS tried to make itself COVID safe, COVID secure. That was never going to happen with a transmissible virus like COVID. We reduced hospital capacity. There were empty wards. There were the unused Nightingale hospitals and other diseases. Oh, listen, come on, diagnosed. come on, come on. Let me get a word in, please. The, the Nightingale hospitals were unused. And this is another great big white elephant that we created, which was symbolically, we created these Nightingale hospitals unaware that we couldn't staff them with specialist staff. That because all the did. staff were self-isolating at home, Brat Pankania, because they'd been pinged by the app. But as NHS GP Rene Hunderkamp pointed out this we week, of course you're going to get around. pinged. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're in an NHS hospital. You will have, um, unfortunately, exposure to COVID. Uh, in fact, Rene Hunderkamp speculates that most NHS professionals caught COVID early in the pandemic because they worked in hospitals. The attempt to make the NHS COVID secure failed. And surgeons were left at home twiddling their thumbs, watching Netflix, baking banana bread rather than treating people. Mark, I don't know if you really want me to engage in this debate. I really want you to engage in this debate. The frontline well, NHS professionals have spent a year and a half listen. being pinged because they had close contact with someone that tested positive for COVID-19. Asymptomatic, they've been sat at home doing nothing rather than treating people. Have you finished? Yes. Will you please let me continue without shouting over me? I would appreciate that very much. I'm speaking on behalf of my there. viewers, thousands of whom have been and untreated I, and, in the last and, 18 months. And you months. have invited me to your panel, and I think I should have the chance of course. to articulate the issues. Of so course. And then, and then I'll come to you, David. Thank you, Barack.
Okay, you have articulated several issues here. You asked me as an infectious disease expert, what would you advise and suggest? And I advise and suggest immediately that we need all our momentums with respect to outbreak control, be it Nipah virus, be it SARS-CoV-2, be it Ebola, whatever. We do need all the, our momentums. That's one point. Second point, going forward in this pandemic, I don't think we will need a lockdown because we have managed to immunize, protect, and save people from dying. Third point, with regard to the National Health Service shutting down and not looking after the heart attacks, the strokes, and the other things, it is a failing and we need to look into it. Fourth point, with regard to the Nightingale hospitals, etc., that were set up, a big failure because we couldn't staff them. We just haven't got the energy staff. And my final point now is this. The National Health Service for decades, at least 20 years that I can recall, has been systematically dismantled, uh, fragmented and underfunded. And with that underfunding, we are always running on about 95, 98% capacity. And when you are running at such a high level of capacity in peacetime, when you are suddenly flooded with a lot of people needing ITU care, etc., unfortunately, many more people die even when they end up in hospital. My point uh, is made. Thank uh, you. Dr. Pankania, thank you so much. And, and do stay with us. Now, Dr. Pankania raises an important point there, David Payton, which is that our I ICU capacity is very limited compared to other Western nations. I believe we've got 25 percent of the ICU capacity, the intensive care capacity of Germany, for example, which is clearly a big factor. Well, the, the pandemic's been going for 18 months now, and we've had lockdowns on and off over that time. So I think rather than the government threatening lockdowns over the next few months, what they should perhaps have done is to say, yes, let's sort out the ICU capacity. They've had plenty of time to do that. Can that, be done? Can that be done quickly, though, David? Well, this is a point, no. though. We need to go back. It's fine to say, yes, of course, lockdowns, we think they're, they, they're effective. We have to be hard-headed and look at the data and the evidence. And the evidence, I'm afraid, is not there that they are effective. In terms of locking down earlier, the first country to lock down was the Czech Republic. Mask mandates, very early lockdown. And everyone was praising it for being the most successful country. And yet we look now, they have the highest death rate of any country in the world from COVID. So we have to look at the data and the data is now clear. Those countries that locked down earlier or longer or harder did not have better outcomes than those, for example, like Sweden, that took a very different approach that took, and Finland as well, that didn't have such hard hitting lockdowns. We cannot ignore that evidence because remember what lockdowns do. They're the most serious assault on human rights and civil liberties that we've seen in this country for many hundreds of years. They involved over months at time. It was a criminal offence to invite even one person into your house for a cup of tea. At one time, it was a criminal offence to sit in a park and sunbathe, even though that's probably one of the best things you can do to you know, improve your resistance to, to, to COVID. And these measures it wasn't just you know, three weeks to flatten the curve or a week in emergencies. In some places, businesses were shut by order of the government for months and months, in some cases over a year. It is absolutely unthinkable. It's not, it wasn't in the plan of the, the World Health Organization plans for dealing with pandemics. It's unprecedented in how we deal with public health. Okay, people may have panicked at the start and they were worried and they thought perhaps this will be successful. Maybe they had an excuse a year and a half ago. There is no excuse now. We know these lockdowns are devastating, but they also don't have significant benefits that people think they will have. And certainly the costs are way higher than any, any possible benefits they may have brought. Uh, briefly, to, to back up Dr. Pankania, though, David, uh, what if we are days away this autumn or this winter from the NHS being overwhelmed? What do you do then? Well, the first thing is, if the thing you're planning to do, which is to lock down, is not going to help, which all the evidence suggests it won't, you don't do something that's going to potentially make things worse. That's the first point. You, what, one of the problems we've had is governments thinking, oh, we've got to do something when that something ends up actually being worse. And we're seeing that now with the proposal for vaccine passports, and particularly this terrible idea that they're sacking care workers who haven't been vaccinated, which is a, and health workers as well, is going to create a huge crisis of staffing uh, in the NHS and in the care sector. So you can't do something that's gonna make things worse just for the sake of doing something. 
Uh, briefly, before I come back to Barat for the final word, David, what is your solution? If we are days away from the NHS being overwhelmed, which I fear we may be this winter, what do we do? Well, the, the NHS is a crisis point for, for, for many years. And of course, that's what you focus on. You don't focus on locking people up and um, shutting businesses down. You focus on the hospitals. And if you have to put more resources in, if you have to make use of the nightingales or bring nurses out of retirement or change the pandemic so that uh, nurses aren't uh, isolating when they haven't got COVID, but have had a contact with COVID, they're all things you, you can do. And, and, and you know, that, that's something which the government has to tackle every, every year and should be planning for now. We've still got months before we're at the peak of the winter crisis, rather than talking about lockdowns, vaccine passports, which you know won't be effective, uh, they should be focusing on improving capacity in the NHS. Uh, Barat, I promise not to interrupt you because we are old pals. Uh, your final thoughts on this? Yeah. Listen, um, I wish to say there's a lot that I agree with David here. I really do. Honestly, I, I, as an expert in infectious disease control, all I ask for is to have the tools to control a novel virus that has appeared. We were not involved in that wholesale lockdown that David has just described, which is harmful. I was saying repeatedly, all I want is reduced human to human interaction. But that resulted in that very severe stay at home, everything shut, which is not what we wanted ever. What we only wanted was reduce human to human interaction. That's all. And that didn't happen. It ended up in a complete shutdown because the government was panicked. And they really need to look at the plans that were made, exercise signal, we direct them to it. And those plans that were made were measured, reasonable, they were implementable, and they were not used. My sincere and deep thanks to Dr. Bharat Pankania, Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. Thank you, Bharat. And Professor David Payton, Professor of Industrial Economics at Nottingham University Business School. My thanks to you both.